Hi, welcome to Creative Space. We are here with Alistair Chapman joining us live from the UK. And uh, there's a little bit of a time difference. Uh, we're here in Los Angeles. Uh, welcome, Alistair. Hey guys, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a time difference. Nice and sunny and warm where you guys are, but it's cold, chilly, and uh, uh, pitch dark here right now. It's uh, evening here, so uh, yep, good to see you all though. So let's talk about the FX9. Uh, I know you've been using it for a long time and you've been actually uh, beta testing this version three upgrade that just came out. So give us kind of a little background on how you've migrated throughout the other XD cam family of cameras that you've used uh, and to the FX9. Wow, how long have you got? That could, take, that could take hours. We got all day, we got all day. I'm a long, long time Sony user. I mean, here in Europe, in broadcast television, Sony have been dominant forever. And yeah, I, I started in the 1980s and it was Sony cameras then, beta cam, then digi beta cameras, then along came the uh, standard definition optical disc and then the high definition XD cam optical disc. Um, and I had a F350 optical disc camera and from there PDW 700. And then, then all of a sudden there was this big, big, the big sensor revolution. So that was then a jump to F5, F55. Um, yeah, I even shot a bit with uh, uh, F65. Um, and then Venice comes along and yeah, that whole new color science that came with Venice. And I was looking at that and thinking, wow, what I wouldn't give to have that new color science. And then Sony came out with you know, FX9, which has a lot of that sort of technology and the look of the Venice camera. It's not a Venice, but it's damned close. And um, it was kind of a, a little bit of a dream come true, really. A nice, small, compact, lightweight camera, real sort of jack of all trades camera, because at the moment I've just got the basic camera here, which is what I use for storm chasing, and I've taken it storm chasing. Um, where you want to be portable, you want to be nimble and quick, but you can build it up with the XDCA on the back if you're doing television news and stuff like that. And then you can live stream with it, with the QoS, uh, really robust streaming system. With version three firmware that's just come out now, you can plug your phone into it via the, the USBs on the XDCA and use it as a modem. And it's just a really powerful camera that I can shoot in full frame one day, and then maybe the next day, in Super 35 because there's awful lot of an awful lot of Super 35 lenses still around and still stay in 4K and that's a really important thing for me and and then with version 3 it's just got so much better that's great i remember that even before version 3 came out you were already testing anamorphic lenses uh, with the FX9 i think at version 1 right tell us a little bit about what now version three is going to bring to you working with anamorphic lenses? Yeah, I, I love working with anamorphic lenses. There, there is something, and, and it's really hard to describe to people actually about the way an anamorphic lens works. So obviously one of the things with an ordinary 4K super 35 millimeter size sensor, um, like the F5 and F55 have got, for example, is they're great for 1.3, 1.35 times anamorphic lenses because they're designed for that widescreen sensor. But all the lenses designed for, for film, for 35 millimeter film, are designed for four perforation, what's commonly called open gate film, 35 millimeter cine film, which is much taller than a super 35 millimeter video sensor. And that makes them really difficult to use on an ordinary Super 35 video camera. But the FX9, because it has a full frame mode, when you put it into full frame, the sensor height, how tall that sensor is, is almost exactly perfect. Um, I think the FX9 is 18.8 millimeters high off the top of my head, and uh, 35 millimeter film frame is 18.1 millimeters high. So it, it's really right where you want it to be in terms of the height. And because it's a 6K sensor, even though when you use a two times anamorphic lens, you still need to crop the sides because those lenses are uh, designed for 35 millimeter film, not for full frame. So they're, they're not as wide as full frame. So even though you've got to crop the sides, it's a 6K sensor and you still end up with as much or in fact more resolution by the time you've done all the stuff you need to do to it than the most commonly used open gate 35 mil, uh, 30, sort of super 35 open gate um, cameras out there. So it produced 
even without version 3 firmware, really, really great anamorphic content with, with uh, those anamorphic two times lenses. But the only thing is you didn't have a way to monitor that on board. You had to use an external monitor or an external viewfinder that could do the de-squeeze. That's what you did, yeah. Yeah. So now with version 3, you have the de-squeeze built in on the viewfinder two times or 1.3 times, and it just makes it really easy. And the, the nice thing is that the two times de-squeeze also crops the sides. So if you use an external monitor and use the two times de-squeeze, you still have a vignette around the edges of the frame. And that's just a function of the way the two, two times anamorphic works with a full frame sensor. And those monitors don't know how to deal with that. But the two times de-squeeze that's built into the FX9 in version two Version three. Just enlarges the image that way just enough to get rid of that vignette. So what you see in the screen, what you see on the viewfinder is pretty much exactly what you're going to end up with after your post-production. And it does look really great. It really does. And you shot some stuff with all of the features, right? You, you have some uh, something that you wanted to share with us today. Yeah, yeah. It's some, a little teaser. So this hasn't been released yet. So just bear with me a, a second. Um, this is a I took to really get to grips with version three. The, I, I felt the best way to find out what it's really like to use is to actually shoot a little short film with it and to use as many of the version three features in this one little short film as I could. So all these shots you're seeing now are done with the touch tracking, um, the real time tracking autofocus. I, I even have a little cameo role in it there. Um, and this is anamorphic. So this is with um, anamorphic lens. And you, you, know, you get the, the lovely sort of J.J. Abrams style lens flares, depends on the lens that you choose. But shooting this way is just so easy now. And I think it really looks nice. It looks great. The touch tracking autofocus makes shooting with this camera so, so easy. And you know, doing a focus pull and getting it right every single time, even the actors on this commented. So this is touch tracking at work. And watch what happens um, as she turns away from the camera. So, and I'll show you this in a minute. I've got a camera here set up. One of the things with the touch tracking is with face eye, face eye autofocus now. If you've selected a face and they turn away from you, oh, that's, that's everything in the video, and they turn away from you, the tracking will then track the back of their head. Whereas before, with face autofocus, it was great when the person was facing the camera or you could see the side of their face, it would track it. But the moment they turned away, of course, it would focus on another face because you've told it to focus on faces. Whereas now, and I tell you what, shall I just go straight into this and show yeah, everyone? Yeah, yeah, I would love it. Yeah, let's do it. And that was great stuff, by the way. When can we, when can we watch the full feature? Right, so let's, let's, let's have a look. So I've got a, this. When can we watch the full feature? Yeah, so this is my FX9 here. And at the moment, if you look top left of the screen, it says MF, one meter, 1.0 meters. Oh, I'm sorry, guys, it's in meters. I should have changed it to feet. Um, it's, in, it's in MF, manual focus. So the camera's currently set to manual focus. And if I turn my focus ring on the lens here, I will focus manually. Here we go, I'll just, just to prove the point, manual focus, so I can take it completely out of focus and it looks horrible. So the camera is in manual focus. The focus switch here on the side of the camera is set to MF. But if I touch the screen, so the only thing I'm going to do now is touch the screen, we bang, we go straight into the tracking mode. So I haven't even got a switch between MF and AF. I can just touch the screen to enable autofocus now. And basically wherever I touch, I'm going to touch on the little dog chew toy, the pink pig. And the camera will focus on that. If I want to focus on another face, I can just touch on that face and the camera goes back to that face. And you'll see we have this little box, which is a box with a bar each side. And that tells me that that is the thing that's in focused. And if they're moving, well, of course, the camera just tracks them. So these could actually be moving through the shot and it would all be tracked. Now, what I really like about this, so let's choose this face here. Now, if you look top left of the screen, there's three little symbols. There's the square box with the wavy lines by it, and that means we have tracking. So we're tracking. Next to that is the person symbol, which means that we're using the face eye priority. And next to that, there is a star. And that star means the camera has remembered that face. Now, 
hopefully this all works. If I turn her away, the camera now tracks the back of her head. Whereas previously, the camera would have focused on another face. As soon as she turns back, it back it's back to focusing on her face again. This just makes so many shots that would have once upon a time been really difficult to do absolutely easy. You know, you're doing a, let's say you're following somebody through a building and maybe you're behind them and they're, they're, they're turning out, they're, you're following them and they're, and they're doing this to talk to you. Yeah, did you see what I did today? And they're walking along and doing this sort of thing. Well, with the Touch AF, it will follow them even if they turn away from the camera. As soon as they turn back, it comes back to them. And when we have this situation like this, where uh, currently I'm in face eye um, priority, let me just change a setting on the camera here for a second. So if I go to my shooting settings and I go down to focus and I change this from priority to AF uh, face only, and I now I'm going to select her face again. One of the great things about this is as soon as the camera, so again, if you look at the top left corner, you see we've got that little star by the side of the person symbol. That means the face is remembered. If I remove that face from the shot, the focus halts. So it's not going to suddenly jump on a different face. Uh, in fact, it did. I don't know why. But generally, the focus will halt when it can't find the face. I think I have a little bit of a problem with these mannequins because they're not real faces. The camera doesn't always recognize them as it should. Let's try it with, with. The artificial intelligence in the camera can recognize artificial, right? It's, it's just, there's some amazing AI. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't see movement. I think it, you know what, I think it does. That there, because I never get, the, I never get quite the same results with the mannequin as a real person. So I take him out. There we go, the focus has, ah, I know what's going on. That's right, you never hit the switch on the, on the camera, right? So you're, you're, yeah. I'm rushing, I'm still in manual focus, and that's why this is doing it. Right, so we're now in autofocus, and it now says, A, by the top left corner, AF, and the little person symbol, only, face only. Select him, and now if I move him out of the shot, in fact, look, so it's going to track him, track, 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 track. He's walked out of the shot. But is it, is it saving both, both faces? It, it recognizes both, right? I, no, I think the, the problem is that the, these faces, they are so similar. And I've, I've, mm. I've experienced this before. If we take, That's true. If we take her face out of the shot, the, because they're mannequins, they're not real faces, they are so similar. Mm -hmm. Now, if, I, if we do the same with just this person here, he walks out of the shot the focus stops. And you see the little exclamation mark now in the top corner. That means the focus is halted because the camera can't find the face it's looking for. As Soon as I bring him back in, that exclamation mark goes away and it focuses on him. And even if you brought him in, yeah. So as I move him around, the AF is gonna focus on him wherever he goes. Soon as and even if you brought him in backwards, right? Like if you, if you brought in, him in from the back of his head and then turned his face. I don't think it'll, it won't recognize his face, but as soon as he turns around, it will. Okay, and then you turn it back around. Yeah, but if I turn him around now, it will still track him. That's right. Yeah, because it's got to see his face. So it's got to know which face it's looking at. So there are limits. I mean, it, it, it's not... It's, it's very, very impressive in what it can do. It really is. Um, but obviously, I mean, just like us, really, if you walked into a room and everyone had their backs of their heads to you, you wouldn't know who was who. You'd have to wait for them to turn around first to know who was who. And the camera is no different in that regard. So it has to be able to see the face. But the fact that when somebody turns away from the camera, that the AF will then track the back of that head, even if there are lots of people in the room, means that you know if you're doing if you do if somebody does wedding videos the fact that you could you know save the bride's face and even if she turns away to throw the bouquet or, or do something else it's not going to suddenly focus somewhere else it will wait for her to turn back again just means it makes focusing this stuff so much easier and pull focuses between two people or two things you know just 
touch where you want to focus. Touch on the chart in the background there. Look at that. ODA discs on the shelf there. Um, nice. And then, and then come back to, to my person. And every time it's right. And when I shot the short film, even the actors commented on it because in terms of blocking and rehearsing a scene, I, I just got them to rehearse and I would just press the screen where I wanted it to focus and it was right. And you know, that makes me look really good as a, as a cinematographer and a filmmaker. Um, you know, I didn't need a focus puller to make that film because the camera got the focus right. And I think I can actually genuinely say hand on heart that the camera never got it wrong. There, there were times perhaps where I didn't touch the right person, so I was trying to follow the dialogue and maybe one actor was talking and then another and I, I didn't press the faces quick enough. But in terms of getting the focus right and being where I wanted it to be, when I pressed the right place, the camera got it right each time. Um, it, it's truly revolutionary. Um, I, was, I was one of those guys who used to stand in front of a room doing a classroom a couple of years ago on cameras and everything else and say, oh, autofocus is for amateurs. You need to learn how to focus properly. Yep, me too. I did the same thing. And when the autofocus came out, I was like, oh, I don't know if it's going to be good, but this is like autofocus on a whole nother level. I mean, it's, it's utilizing the AI of the sensor and it's communicating with the lens. Speaking of lenses, what lens are you using right now? I see you have a 1.8. Uh, that, that's a really embarrassingly cheap lens I've got on the camera right at the moment. It was just the, it, it, it's only the little, the, the really cheap 50 millimeter F 1.8. Uh, it's not the best lens, I, that one. Um, I've, I've still got a gap in my lens lineup at 50 millimeters. I've got the, the you know, I've got the 85s and I've got the 24s and 35s, but for some reason I've not yet bought myself a decent 50. So I, I do need to um, to update this lens. It does. In, in the video you showed earlier, what lenses were you using for that? It produces a good picture. It does. It's a nifty 50. I like it. Uh, yeah. Right. So, so for the video, because we wanted to show. Um, really sort of what an out basically an out of the box fx9 could do we use the 28 to 135 f4 lens you know the 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 big the big one with the um manual stroke auto you pull the ring at the front to switch between manual and auto the 28 to 135 mil lens and it worked brilliantly and and, and most people don't realize that that was the lens that i use they look at the footage and they think, wow, what did you use? And then I say, well, I used that lens. And they're like, really? Because they, they assume that because that lens is a zoom lens, because it is a very versatile lens, that it doesn't also produce a really beautiful image, but it does. Um, and and it, you know, as a one lens fits all solution, it's really great because we shot the entire film, except for the anamorphic, where we used a 1.35 times lens adapter for that. Um, with that lens and it worked great. What uh, anamorphic lenses were you using? So um, for that I was using um, a Sony 28, the 28 millimeter f2 lens with a SLR Magic 1.35 times anamorphic adapter on it. Oh wow, nice. Um, so, yeah, well that, that it's something that I own and, I, and it flares like crazy. I like the flares. Um, which for the well, that was the whole point. The whole point was to show that this is anamorphic. You know, we yeah. weren't trying to pretend that this was anything other than anamorphic and, and it flares like crazy. I think for some things too much perhaps, but for that film to get the effect that we wanted on the exterior shots, it, it, it worked really well. And the autofocus I noticed even in your low light, you were, you were, were you on F4000 ISO when you were shooting the, the low light? Most of it, I think there's a lot of people that don't understand what low light is sometimes. So it was shot with, the whole film was shot with S-Log3, recording internally, XAVC. The shots in the control room, command center, they were all shot at 800 ISO and 400 EI. Now, because I'm controlling the light in that, um, I'll just bring the video, I'll, yeah, just bring the video back up again. Be because I'm controlling the light, in this room, I can set my highlights, I can set the, the levels. So I can use 400 EI at 800, really low noise picture, because I'm completely in control. I don't have any dynamic range issues or anything like that. And, and then you grade it and, and it ends up looking dark because of the grade and the lighting. So one of the, one of the key things with making something look dark is contrast. 
So when you get this really high contrast, but without the big highlights, it actually looks really dark. Now for the exteriors, um, and this was actually very dark outside where I have much less control over my lighting, this was where I switched to 4000 and shot at 4000 ISO. And I think I used 2000 EI. And there are some other shots that we did in the film. I haven't got examples of them here where the other feature that we used is the Super 16 scan mode. So we've, I mean, th th this film is a real mish mishmash of weird lens choices and everything else because it was really- th When can we see it? Well, when, where can we see it and when can we see it? Hopefully in two or three weeks time, it's, it's edited, it's finished. It's not, it's not a big long film, but it was done. So some of you may be aware I did a whole series of FX9 guide videos on how to shoot with the FX9. So we've updated all of those with all the new information about version three, and they're coming out very soon uh, using this example footage. And then the film will come out a little bit after that as well, and you'll be able to watch the whole thing in its entirety. But one of the other features in version three is the Super 16 2K scan mode. And that allows you to really punch in on your image as a digital extender, if you want, by three times. So if you're doing news and you suddenly really need to get a much tighter shot, let me see if um, we can do it. So I've got scan mode assigned to my one of my assignable buttons. So there we go, 5K and then uh, 3K. That's as far, uh, 4K, super 35. Now that's as far as I can go at the moment because I'm recording in um, or outputting in uh, UHD. So let me change uh, my recording format to HD. This shouldn't upset anything that you guys are seeing. And now using my assignable button, I can go to the 2K um, scan. And you can just, I mean, you can see how big a difference there is between the full frame. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if you suddenly needed to get that really tight shot, but you didn't have the right lens, so one application is to use it as a digital zoom. The other application for it is to use it with uh, two third inch B4 ENG lenses, your typical news gathering camera lens. So a couple of the shots in the film, they're shot in a corridor and it's in almost pitch dark. It's really, really dark and my spy is coming down the corridor. And, I, and to add a bit of drama to the shot, I wanted to use a crash zoom. So we go from a, a, a wide shot of him and we boom, crash in. You can't do that with many full frame lenses because they don't have the zoom range or they're not par focal or they, they just can't zoom that quickly. So we used the B4 two third inch ENG lens in the Super 16 scan mode to get this really dramatic boom crash zoom in on him as he comes down the corridor. Um, and it worked really well. I mean, it was, it's, a, it's, it's a gimmick really. It was one of the things that was written into the script of the film to show off what you can do with version three. Um, but but it, it works and I really like the effect that we got. The other thing that you can do with the uh, 2K Super 16 scan, and actually I wish I'd, um, Brought, brought a copy of, uh, of the footage with me is shoot slow motion with it. Because the 2K Super 16 scan mode uses every single pixel within that scan area, the quality of the slow motion when you're shooting at 100, 180 frames per second is really nice. Um, so it's a really useful tool uh, for doing that. And I mean, this version three update is a huge update for this camera. It, it really transforms its capabilities and, and takes it to a, another level up. I mean. It's a great freebie if you've already got one of the cameras. That's true. It is a great freebie. And, and even in the broadcast world, uh, we're now able to connect the RCP controllers uh, when you have the XDCA connected. Is that something you've tried out as well, like the RCP control? Or is that something that you'd ever need to try? RCP, RCP remote control is not something that I myself normally deal with and, and use. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find a way to write that into the film. So we <laughs> didn't use it for the film, but <laughs> I have played with it. I have used it because I've made a video about how to set it up and, and how to do all of that. So that, that's coming out soon in the FX9 guide series. And it's, it's great, you know, you can put the, R the, the XDCA on the back of the camera and most of the current RCPs, the 3500, 3100s, I think 1500 series as well, if I'm not mistaken, 
you plug in an ethernet cable, you turn on the wired um, LAN connection on the camera, and you can control the camera from the RCP the same as you would the majority of other studio cameras. So you can rack your aperture, you can go into a lot of the paint settings and change those, you can control exposure remotely, um, just as you would with a studio camera. And that opens up all sorts of possibilities, I think, for outside broadcasts where people are trying to get maybe shooting a music concert or something like that, where traditionally you'd have used two third inch cameras, um, but you can now step up to a full frame, use it in either full frame or Super 35 to get that more film-like look, but still have the workflow that you would have had with a, a traditional studio camera with, with you know, somebody in the OB truck or in the control room racking the cameras so that they all look the same and they all match. Um, you know, it's th what this little camera does for what it costs is quite remarkable. Yeah, and adding that feature just makes it that more versatile. You know, it's, uh, it really is a, an all-in-one camera uh, that, that can do it all. I mean, I, I've been see, seeing it in different operations and, and different setups where you won't even recognize the camera. Uh, but yeah, like you said, and, and it just opens up new doors to, to all types of possibilities and, and solutions for even broadcast, slow motion, uh, when you want to use Super 16 or even the, the B4 with the two-thirds. So having the RCP control with the, the broadcast lenses is another thing. Um, and that's with the LAEB1 adapter that would allow you to do the, the two-third inch um, on the FX9. Same as the FS7, right? Yeah, that's right. It's the LAEB1 adapter. And if you use the LAEB1 with a modern two-third inch lens that has ALAC, that's the automatic lens aberration compensation, that all works, so it, it helps reduce your chromatic aberration and problems like that. That some zoom, some zoom lens. I mean, if you've got a twenty times zoom lens, op optically they're perhaps not quite as good as a cinema lens. Um, but the automatic lens aberration correction really sort of narrows that gap and makes them look perhaps better than they, they would do otherwise. And all of that stuff works. Um, and I, I think this is really going to appeal to a lot of small broadcast studios. So. I mean, I, I'll be perfectly honest and say, if you want the very best two-third inch performance in the world, you'd buy a two-third inch camera and, and use that. But there's going to be an awful lot of people that, you know, maybe you're somebody that does television news um, and you might want to do your interviews, your nice sit-down setup interviews in full frame with a beautiful, you know, cinema lens or a, you know, a nice G Master lens on the camera to get the nice bokeh and everything else and, and do your interview that way. And then you might have to go down into the streets and shoot the shot of an aeroplane landing that's a mile and a half away the other side of an airport and then you need two third inch you need a b4 zoom lens and everything else and you can do it all with the one camera and i and i think that's really where this camera comes into its own is that ability to do both really quite well um and and you know only one one camera body that you need to take with you with the XDCA on the back, you can run it off your normal VLOC batteries. And then you've got the QoS streaming, so you could stream it. You can now upload proxies while you're shooting. So that's another new thing in version 3, is that while you're actually shooting the clip, once you've shot um, 10 seconds or so of the clip, it will then start uploading the proxy file back to your base as a, as a, a lower resolution proxy. So they can actually start editing before you've even finished shooting. And, and the, they could actually have the story cut before you've actually wrapped. Um, you know, there's amazing things that can be done with this camera. That's great. Yeah, you touched upon that that fast editing and being able to upload because I, I remember before you could upload as soon as you stopped recording, it would just upload to the to the C cloud. Um, but now you're saying that you can also tether right to to your phone with the USB on the on the XDCA. Yeah, so the, so the new things in that regard in this firmware are that with version 3 is the proxy upload is done in chunks now. So previously it used to upload an entire clip. So that meant you'd have to stop recording before the clip could be uploaded. And if you were doing a long interview or something like that, that could be half an hour it could, or even an hour before you can then stop and upload the clip. Now the, the proxy is done in chunks and you can set the chunk length in the, in the settings. And as soon as you've recorded that first length of chunk, I think the shortest one is 10 seconds, the proxy upload will start in the background while you're shooting. And 
with the XDCA on the back of the camera, you can now use the two US, there are two USB connectors in the top, and you can plug in um, a mobile phone into those connectors, and it, it's, all, it's automatic actually, I can't remember, it's iOS 11, I think, and Android, I th you'll have to correct me if it's not iOS 11 and, and above, you just plug it in, yeah, you just plug it in and the phone just says, do you want to connect to the device, and you just click yes, and the phone becomes a modem for the camera. So if you've got a 5G phone, you get a 5G connection. If it's 4G, it's 4G. And it means you just haven't got to buy separate dongles. Um, and if, you know, if you've got something like the Sony Xperia Pro phone that has an HDMI input on it as well, that phone can be your monitor. It can be your upload device. You can use it for your 5G connection, for your proxies, for your QoS streaming, and it fits in your pocket. And it's, it's one of those things, you know, in fact, actually, look at this. Ta-da! Sony Xperia Pro. Um, so, you know, this sits in your pocket, HDMI on it, 5G connection, plug it into your camera, and you have everything that you need for a broadcast production right here. You could, I could do a live news story, you know, I'd have to have the XDCA on the back of the camera for, for, the, for the USB, but, you know, that's pretty much all you need to do live television news these days. You don't need a great big satellite truck anymore. Yeah, so I actually have the XDCA here so you get, get an idea of what you're adding to the back of the body here. Uh, but what Alice was mentioning is that up on top here, you do have two USBs, which before were able to use for uh, a SIM card, right? A USB dongle that can be... Uh, transmit so now that be, being able to use it with a phone is amazing and I I'm pretty sure I don't know in Europe but I know that the Xperia Pro is the only phone that has a HDMI input um, most phones just have an HDMI output so it's the actual the only the phone that can can do that 5g uh, streaming or you know transmission or even use it like you said for proxy and and having that that editing happen before you wrap that's amazing that just <laughs> speeds everything up yeah, um, when I went to Iceland earlier in the year to shoot the volcano there, to, to get to the volcano, it's a, um, about a two and a half mile hike each way to the volcano, two and a half miles back. And if you want to go to various different locations, there's a lot of hiking. I think over the three days that I went up to the volcano in total, I hiked something around 25 miles. And it was exhausting because it's up a mountain, it's not flat and it's rocky and difficult terrain. And, and having the ability to take a phone that you can then use to, as a monitor to stream and to do all of those things was just wonderful because it, it, it weighs nothing. And, and where we are now with this technology, it's really transformative because it's accessible to anybody now. It's not something, you know, if you wanted to do live television news, you know, e even buying something like a, a live view unit is a big investment and you have to lease it and, and, and all the rest. It's not an easy thing to, to get. It's bulky, it's big, and you probably don't always have it with you. Whereas when it's your phone that can do these things and your phone can plug into the camera that you're using anyway, it just means that, you know, maybe you're driving to another shoot or another job and, and something happens in front of you that's newsworthy you could go live and be on the air in seconds. And it's just really changing the way we think about how we do television news and stuff like that. Um, and, and, you know, going to Norway in January to shoot the Northern Lights, and I'll have my 5G phone and I'll be able to plug it into the camera and hopefully stream the Northern Lights. I mean, you know, wouldn't, isn't that going to be cool if people can watch the Northern Lights live in high quality, not just from some webcam, yeah, you know, this is you know, you know, hopefully will be really good quality, and um, it's just so enabling the technology now. Well, if I can't make it out there personally, I'm definitely going to watch it streaming live. So please share the link with us, uh, give us the information where we can we can find that, um, and we're really excited to see what you're going to do with new version three. Thanks so much for your time, Alistair. How rapidly the focus moves from one distance to another, and and I think there's it's well worth spending some time to learn how those different things interact learn how to use the focus zones, then learn the difference between face only and face priority, or turning the face IAF off if you're shooting maybe landscapes and things like that, and really learn how to use it and to get the very best from it. Because like any of these other tools that these cameras have, they're there to help you, but you'll only get the most out of them if you really understand them. 
And the autofocus is very, very powerful and very programmable and customizable. So it's really important that you learn how to use it and to drive it properly. And it might be that maybe you don't always use it, but frankly, I'm using it now 99% of the time and it's really made my life much easier. But um, yeah, thanks for, um, th thanks for the chat today, Samuel. It's been really great.